series and today I'm going to talk about a really important step in changing anything that you want to change in this year ahead and that's to get uncomfortable. Getting uncomfortable. How many people like being uncomfortable? <laughs> you know, it's... <laughs> We want to get comfortable being uncomfortable. We want, and I really want, by the end of what I'm going to talk about today, to get you thinking and committed towards saying, I want to always be in a state of being uncomfortable. Because that's how I'm going to grow. That's how I'm going to see my potential. You cannot realize the potential and the giftedness of what God made you without stretching and being uncomfortable. God's given every single person here unique gifts, talents, and abilities. You are designed to be one of a kind, and it's a special and wondrous thing. And it is, if you have thought to yourself that maybe you're not realizing your potential, that maybe you're not living to all that's possible in life, a big key to this is getting comfortable being uncomfortable, being in a state of being uncomfortable, and just embracing that. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 24. It says, do you not know that those who run in a race, all run, everybody runs in the race, like, like at the Cupid's Sunday run, you know, some suck and some don't, right? Like, it's just like some of the big races, like uh, beta breakers, right? Some people suck at running, right? <laughs> and some people are really good at it. So they all run if you're in the race, but one receives the prize, Run in such a way that you might obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. And I wanna, I'm going to be looking at that word temperate. Now they do it, you know, the people that compete in games, to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore, I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and I bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should be, become disqualified. Now there's so much chalked in this verse, so I'm going to kind of break this down. So it's talking about the fact that they're talking about this race, really. It's figurative about how we live our lives. So it's saying that, there's, that we want to live in a way as if we're wanting to win. How interesting is that? You know, I don't know about you guys, but I was always, I, I had a lot of fear about even setting goals or anything like that for up until recently, quite frankly. You know, because I always thought, well, it's stupid, or I thought, what if I don't make it? Or, you know, then I'm gonna feel like a loser or a failure, you know? So I just don't even wanna stretch or go for anything. You know, or if I set something, then I'd think, who am I? Have you ever thought that? Like you're afraid to set a goal or really go for something because you're like thinking, who do I think I am? You know? It's just like, and if I don't make it, I'm going to feel like an idiot. So I've just recently realized how much that held me back from really being all that God's called me to be. So it's talking about in life, in life. It's short, isn't it, guys? I'm 55, so I'm becoming more aware of the fact that it's short. Like, you know, some, I remember, I don't know if you guys, you know, remember if anybody was, some of you guys are 16 years old. So you think it just goes on forever. Some of you that are older giggle, right? It's like, it feels like it's forever, you know? But we want to live in such a way as to go for the gusto, to go for the gold. And it says... If you're competing, in order to compete, everyone that competes is temperate. That word temperate means self-control and discipline. Okay, do those sound like fun words? No. <laughs> <laughs> they, you know, it's kind of funny, but it's just sort of like self-control and discipline. Kind of sound like a drag, you know? 
But as I was talking about last week with the old man, new man, real freedom comes from these things. We, we want to get to the place that we value this. Self-control and discipline, you think of those as losing freedom, right? Has anybody ever co equated those words? Yeah. Self-control, that sounds like losing freedom. Discipline, losing freedom. Those things actually make you freer. Yeah. Huh. They actually increase what you're able to do. We talked about it last week. If you sit on a sofa eating bonbons, that is not it feels free because you're doing whatever you feel like doing. It feels good. It feels free. I'm going to do what I darn fool please. I'm going to sit on the sofa and eat bonbons. There are people that eat themselves into captivity. Truly. And that's pretty tragic. Real freedom. And there's so many. We're gonna, it's, it, it's interesting. The Bible often uses things like, like, like athletics, things like that. And compares them to spiritual things and to our spiritual walk. We see athletes, the most trained athletes, do they have more or less freedom when it comes to their body? More. Like a lot more. Isn't it amazing? The things, when you've seen things that some athletes do that take your breath away and you go, how is that possible for a human being to do that? There's more capacity, there's more freedom, there's more freedom in discipline. You have more choices. Because yeah. wow. as adults, we choose to discipline ourselves. We choose self-control. We have this idea oftentimes, a lot of times if you've had some kind of, I've had a very controlling childhood. You know, my mom, like even as an adult, she wanted to tell me what kind of toilet paper to buy, what kind of OJ to buy, you know. It's just like, if you've had controlling people in your lives, oftentimes we have a knee-jerk reaction to thinking that self-control or discipline is somebody controlling us. Well, guess what? As an adult, you get to choose those things. They're difficult, but they actually lead to freedom and to living to our full potential. So it says, they do it. It's really interesting here. They do it to obtain a perishable crown. People train for years to win that gold medal at the Olympics, don't they? It's hard to imagine. People start at like five years old, don't, or maybe they even start younger in some, in some cases. But it's incredible the hours and hours of training to get there. And what's it for? A gold thing around your neck. It says if people are willing to put that much into it for a corrupt, perishable crown, it says, but we spiritually, as far as living our lives for God, for an imperishable crown. That there's a reward, that there's some day coming, that there's rewards for all eternity. That, that there's some things that are worth disciplining ourselves for that have payoff for all eternity. It says, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore, I run thus, not with uncertainty, and thus I fight, not as one that beats the air, which is kind of like not doing a whole lot, right? <laughs> you know? It says, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, which means bring it into where it does what I tell it to do, which takes discipline. Lest when I've preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. It was kind of cool because Sandra said to me at the wedding yesterday, I was pretty blessed. She was like, oh, how good, I'm emotional thinking about it. She's very, very disciplined when it comes to the gym. You should see this lady, she's just about as ripped and there's like not a little <laughs> pinch of anything on that body but uh, she's like she knows what it's like to discipline her body and she's just like really you know walk with God she's like I want to do that for God I know what it is to be fit physically I was like yes you do <laughs> she's like she's like I want to be fit like that for God how cool is that I said honey you know what you're talking about yeah. you know amen Said, sounds like the ambassador program. She goes, yes, it is. That's, <laughs> <laughs> That's our one-year leadership training program. Uh, anyway. Um, discipline is necessary for any spiritual growth, for any area that is not where we want it to be in our lives. And so, do you kind of get some, do you feel like you got discipline in some areas? Other areas, not so much. Are there areas you'd like some discipline that you don't got it? Yes. Yeah. 
You gotta get discipline. If you ever sit there and go, I need self-discipline, I need self-discipline. <laughs> self-discipline comes from others disciplining you. It's not, it's not a solo thing. If there's areas in your life that you're lacking that, you need to get help from other people. It's a godly principle. So I want to take a look at that in Hebrews 12. It's kind of interesting too. We need others for that have done it before us. You need other people that have succeeded. If you know you want to get super fit, guess what? Ask somebody that's done it. Then that's been there, that's been on the path, right? You know, somebody's got an awesome body that you'd like to have one like that. Ask them what to do, right? You know, if it's physical fitness stuff. Spiritually, it's the same idea. That's um, whether, you know, the things that you got to grow in. Hebrews 12 and verse 5, it says, And have you forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons? My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord. And chastening means discipline, correction, and training. So we need to get discipline. Correction is we need feedback that says when we're not when we're off track. We're not really going to do awesome in life without feedback. So we want to get in a place where that doesn't feel like we failed. You know, you ever have somebody tell like give you feedback on something that isn't going well and you feel like, oh my gosh, I just I'm a loser, I'm terrible, I'm just I'm never going to get this. Part of this is where you want to be able to fail and have that be normal. Failing is a part of growth. There shouldn't be shame in it. It shouldn't be, you know, you don't want to get feedback from people that are shaming because that's pretty hard to have it be okay to fail when people are being, you know, are withdrawing love from you, things like that. So you need to be in a safe environment where people love you while you're failing. You know, it's okay, it's normal. You want somebody to go, yeah, it's normal to fail. You know? I'm going to love you. I'm going to be here for you. It's okay. Let's get up and try it again. You know? That there's, but anyway. So it says, don't despise. We don't want to despise the chastening of the Lord. We don't want to despise the discipline, correction, or training that comes from God. Or be discouraged when you're rebuked by Him. We don't I want it to be like if if you know if God's correcting on us something, it's because he loves us. You know? That we're not discouraged by this. Because God is always for us, God loves us. God never when we fail, I don't care what kind of failure it is. I you know, I seriously do not care how bad your failure is. If you fall down, God is not going, I am so sick of this out of you. Wow. He's not saying that like I'm over, I'm done. How many times do I have to tell you? I've told you this before, can't you get it together? That is not what God's speaking to you. God's saying, I love you, I'm for you, I'm rooting for you right now. I don't care if you fall over and over again, my arms are still here to embrace you and to love you and to fight for you. Yeah. You can do it. Amen? It says in verse 6, For whom the Lord loves, he chastens. You know, parents, they say, you know, he that spares the rod hates his child. Like, if you don't give any correction to your children, they're going to turn up a mess. Children need correction. There's no love in that. It's hard, right, as a parent, correcting your children. It's not fun. Kids cry. You know, it's one of those things like, oh, it's not pleasant to dish it out, is it, parents? Like, you know... It says, um, and scourges, which is just, you know, rebuke every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? In verse 11, it says, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Getting correction isn't like, woohoo! Loved hearing that. You know, <laughs> it says, but painful. Uh, nevertheless, afterwards, it yields peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. There's that word trained again. 
It's, it's a learning process. It's not overnight. It's not quick. There's a lot of failure in it. But it yields fruit. Fruit is what our lives produce. Fruit, it's a figure of speech that speaks about what we're producing. And so you can see what our lives are producing by, the, by fruit. It's like, what are our lives evidencing? Are our lives evidencing that there's, like, you know, people that feel loved by us, that there's people's lives that are changed by you, you know? Is that the fruit that you're, what are you producing, like, in, in your life? Where's the fruit of that? Um, you know, is your family, are your relationships awesome? Are you making a difference? You know, that's fruit. It says, um, it produces fruit when you've been trained. You know, and there's pain. Like, we have a tendency in our culture to think anything that feels good is not good. That's insane. You know, it's just like, just because something feels, doesn't feel good doesn't mean it's not good for you. That's what working out, again, working out is a great analogy for, for, for that. There's pain and then there's harm. You know, like there's pain where you hurt. It doesn't feel good, and harm. Harm is something that causes damage to you. Something can hurt and actually be good for you. And that's what we're going to get, actually, in the rest of this verse. It says, in verse 12, Therefore strengthen, and that word strengthen is specifically speaking to build anew. It's a, it's a unique word for strengthen. It means to build anew, and specifically for a deformed person. And so it's saying, strengthen the hands which hang down. And that hang down means weaken or, or exhausted or it, there's like a deformity in it. It's just weakness or deformity. So it says, we, strengthen the hands that hang down and the feeble knees. Make straight the paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated but rather healed. So sometimes there have been things and patterns in our life. You know, you ever hear about like bones that get grow, that grow back together wrong, and they're you know they're kind of funny and what have you. And so sometimes they gotta rebroke them, break them again, right, and reset them so that they set straight. And so sometimes that's that's what it's speaking about. Is sometimes in order to correct things like this is specifically think, talking about deformities, things like that, things have to be broken to set them straight so that we can be healthier. And sometimes the process of that is difficult or challenging or painful, etc. But it's, but it's talking about the fact that it's healing, that it, that it ends in healing. And so, um, uh, yeah, so it comes from love. It comes from love. Anyway, let's go to another one. In Philippians 3 and verse uh, 12. You know, it's funny, like, we always think, too, like, we have such a self, like, do it by yourself, kind of like there's shame in getting help. You know, like, there's, I'm self-sufficient, I'm a self-starter, you know, everything's self, 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 self. It doesn't work. Henry Cloud has a book um, called Integrity that's a really wonderful book about some of the biggest corporate leaders, CEOs of massive, you know, of, of these big companies. And he talks about the fact that the company, and there's some parallels between companies that were big and just crashed, whereas companies that uh, wound up making turnarounds or grew or took new gains, and it came from being able to get help from recognizing that we need help, that it, like that, that there's more power in that, that that's God's design to get help from God and help from others, um, and to normalize that, that there's no shame in that at all. In Philippians uh, three and verse twelve, it says, "Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may hold." Lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. So it's interesting here because it's talking about, it's great. The Apostle Paul says, I'm not, I haven't attained, I'm not there. It's not like I've arrived. A lot of times people tend to look at expecting life to be like, I'm going to work real hard and get somewhere, and then I've arrived, and I'm done. My actors, I teach acting classes. That's my job, job, so. I mean, for many job, so. Um, 
because I'm a volunteer here. But. So it's funny because it's really hard. Acting's hard. You know, you might not realize that. Um, everybody thinks it's so easy. It's not easy. It's a lot of hard work. Uh, and so a lot of times it's hard because my actors avoid sometimes doing scenes because they're afraid to fail. They're just like, a lot of times people come into acting, they expect that they should be good at the start of acting class. Day one in acting class, they come in and think that they should be awesome already. You know? And so it's the painful part of learning, and it's just sort of like people get really tired of, like they'll get up and they'll avoid even doing scenes because they don't want to do a scene and do it badly. They're just like, oh, it's embarrassing, I suck, I look stupid, you know, and you can't get good at being an actor without going through the process of getting up there in front of people and looking stupid a lot before you get good, and that's uncomfortable. It's super uncomfortable, but you can't get to be an awesome, awesome actor without going through that process. And so along the way, it's just sort of like part of one of my jobs as a teacher is telling, is getting people comfortable with being uncomfortable. With saying, it's just like you're not going to get where you want to go. I promise you can't get there another way. There's not a way to skip over this part. You know, I had uh, one of my actors years ago, it was so funny, we, got, we, have one of the, we have this saying called embrace the sucking. And what that means is embrace when you suck. Like to think, like embrace it, like it's a good thing when you suck. Like to turn it in, instead of dreading sucking, like oh I hate sucking. So it happened when uh, one of the girls in class, she got so sick of sucking in class, and she just was like, she's like, I'm so sick of it. When am I going to be over? When's it over, the, the sucking part? Like, you know, when do I get to skip over that? And I was just like, you can't skip over it. A lot of people like to try and like come to class and skip over that part. You can't. To be awesome at something, you have to go through the sucking part. So you can't, you can't get to this, I've already attained part. There is no, you never want, as soon as you get to I've arrived, you're going to stop growing. You're going to stay stagnant. There is no I've arrived in life, guys, in anything in life. I don't care what it is, whether it's your spiritual life, whether it's your career, whether it's whatever, unless your job's super easy. You know, whatever you want as far as your dreams or aspirations or anything, you, if you want to be awesome and live to your potential, you want to keep stretching. Never have that I've arrived mentality. I've already attained. Paul's saying, I haven't already attained. It's not perfect. It doesn't look perfect. We want to get rid of that expectation. It's poison. It holds you back. Do you know what I mean? And you want to pe have people that are accepting of you and your failures of that too and loving. It's one of the reasons is our church culture, it's searchlight. A big part of our church culture is to make it safe for people to flail around and fail and be messy and that. And then it takes a long time. That's why so many people are comfortable here talking about messy things. So it says, it's not like I've already attained, but I press on. It says that I may lay hold for that which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. And then he says, I have, then we go. I've not already attained, already perfected. There we go. I don't count myself to have apprehended, to have got it. I've not arrived. Again, it's repeated. You see how this is repeated? It's not living with an I've arrived or looking to have that be what it's about. But one thing I do, forgetting what's behind. Now that forgetting doesn't mean just not think about it. We talk about that and the dating workshop and some other things. If not, it's not like, oh, just act like it didn't happen. It's not caring for, which is a process of grieving, etc. But letting go of that and reaching forward. And that reaching forward means to stretch out, which is uncomfortable. You stretch out beyond, you know what a stretch is? It's doing something uncomfortable. Like this isn't a stretch. <laughs> oh, I'm stretching. <laughs> Not stretching. Stretching is where it's uncomfortable, not where it's going to cause you harm, but it's beyond your comfort level, right? So you're stretching forward to where you want to go. Where do you want to be? In it, whatever it is. Where do you want to be spiritually? Go past your comfort level. Where is that? And keep stretching forward. 
to those things which are ahead. Let's go to Hebrews uh, chapter 10 and verse 36. And I love this too. It says, For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. So this means you got to hang in there. you got to be patient. Anything that you really want to do takes time. You know, part of the thing is, is it's, it's not like you're a big screw-up because it doesn't come together right away. There's not like it's something wrong with you. That's normal to, to grow. And what anything hard, you know, like it's just sort of like, okay, go fish. I always think, of, I don't know why I always think of go fish, but, you know, that's an easy game, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I always think of that. It's just something easy. But it's just sort of like, if that's all you're aspiring to, then you... <laughs> stretching in that. But I but think about the things you want for your life, whether it is realizing the gifts that God gave you. Or especially honestly, I always think of this stuff cuz to me the center of all of life is God and our walks with God. So there's no place I want to stretch more than my walk with God, my spiritual life. Cuz that leads everything. If I'm sitting there and I'm stretching for God and I'm putting God first in my life, I have seen this. Like it says, if you seek God first, everything else will come about. You will see change in every area of your life. So if there's ever a place you want to stretch, it's in your walk with God. You know, as far as your growth goes, it takes discipline, which is repeating things that are difficult. Having some commitments. It's one of the reasons we do the ambassador program, which... Um, we take, just as a little example, the ambassador program is something I personally am very, very passionate about. It's our one-year leadership training program in our church. And it's, it's a year where I work with people and mentor them for a year. And it's a hard thing because for a year you make a bunch of commitments to really make God the center of your life. And you're expected to stretch and it takes faith. You know? But the reason that... Um, I'm passionate about it is for many reasons. I've seen people grow. I've seen people's lives change. But also as a church, we're a baby church. We just started a year and a half ago. But I am very passionate that we raise leaders that are trustworthy people. We raise leaders whose lives are open and honest. That it's not like... And it takes time to grow that. To have integrity. To have self-control. I There's nothing that upsets me more than seeing churches that have, when you, churches have irresponsible leaders and then you hear people getting abused or people, like, to me, it just makes me mad as hell. You know, I just, there's nothing more infuriating than people coming to a church where they're supposed to be able to trust people, trust people's lives and hearts, and the people haven't proved the test of time. They put people in leadership and they, what are they proving? You know, they haven't walked anything out. It takes, for people to be trustworthy people, you've got to have a pattern of trustworthiness. And part of that it takes discipline and self-control, etc., to be a trustworthy servant of God. It affects all of their lives. It radically changes people's careers even. You know, and their jobs. Because when you have God at the center and you're doing stuff that's healthy and healing, it impacts your whole life. This stuff, the principles in God's word, work for everything that you do in your life. It's powerful. It's pretty exciting. So think about, I want, I'm going I'm to close out with prayer now. I just want to, I want you guys to think. We're going to do a little meditation and then I'll close out with prayer. And then uh, I want to uh, uh, share a few things about our big day before Danny comes up too. But, uh, okay, close your eyes. We'll do a little meditation. I want you to think right now about, think about where you want to be for 2015. This is our last New Beginnings teaching. And so I want you right now to just get quiet with God and think about your heart's desire for 2015. What would you like to see? What God's, what's God calling you to as far as your gifts and your abilities? 
What are the areas you've been too afraid to stretch before? What are the areas that you could really stretch with God right now that have been scary? In your walk. So I want you to just ask God right now to help you. Because we want to get help from God and help from others. Just ask God, God, help me in the areas that I've been uncomfortable. Help me to embrace being uncomfortable in my life. To not run for comfort, but run for the things that you're calling me to do. Run for the things that stretch me, that help me to be all that I can be for you, that help me to realize my potential, God. Because God's big. God's loving and patient, and God doesn't give up on you. And it's okay to fall along the way, but just to keep stretching. That's all we have to do is hang in there, have endurance, not give up, to keep stretching. Because God will be there for us in this. And then who's maybe, you know, further ahead on the path that you could ask for some help, maybe? You know, is it time to get into a home fellowship if you haven't? It's a great place to get some support and help in the things that you're stretching. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time that 2015 that we don't have to be afraid, that it's okay to fail and to fall down, God, because you love us unconditionally, you accept us unconditionally, God. Help us to stretch, help us to be brave, help us to keep a lifestyle of being uncomfortable, that we can keep growing and realizing our potential in you, God. Thank you, God. Amen.